not that I have anything to do, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for choosing this session. It would be very lonely if you um, haven't showed up. Um, my name is Mirza Jelmo. I'm the child poverty technical lead for Save the Children in Myanmar and Thailand. Um, and um, I'll be the moderator for the session today. We have three very interesting presentations, I would say. The topic itself um, addresses something that we are witnessing for the many, many years now where many of the rural people are actually moving to the urban centers um, and the urban poverty has become a hot topic, I would say, um, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, maybe more in some areas, but I would say that the international community for certainly is um, taking maybe last 10 years to look at it with more seriousness and with more eagerness. Um, we're gonna start with three presentations uh, by our distinguished guests and speakers. And after that, we're gonna go into series of questions. Um, we're gonna remove all these formal, I would say, set up, put three chairs out there, and we're gonna have a, a discussion on what actually can be done. Um, we would like you to we would like to invite you to be very practical, very I would say direct in your questions, in your thoughts. Um, we really wish to use this session to come up with some recommendations that can actually be useful, maybe not in one country but in some others. Uh, we'll have um, our participants online as well, and uh, we'll try to include them through Mintimeter um, to include all their inputs as well. So. Um, not to spend too much time on this intro, I believe that we are all eager to see the presentations that, that we are about to witness. Um, I would like you to imagine starting 20 years ago um, in Bangladesh and trying to form a non-state coalition of organizations fighting for better education. Um, we are lucky to, to have this story told for us today as we will be hosting Ms. Rashida Chodburi, sorry for my pronunciation, and I apologize deeply if it's wrong. Um, she's the executive director of Campaign for Popular Education, um, non-state coalition gathering over 800 organizations, um, and she'll be sharing her experience with us um, at the start of this session. Thank you very much, and Rashida, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, dear delegates who are here in person and who are attending probably online, uh, organizers, volunteers, good morning, everybody. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here uh, because uh, all my life I've been an activist. Never been to academia, not part of an expert group or anything but working with communities for the last 30 years almost and for establishing their right to education. Special thanks to Thai government uh, for hosting it and thank you, Bangkok. It's a fascinating city. And any time I've been visiting, I've been fascinated by Bangkok. And I have learned so much over the years and during the last whole day and so much for you. Fascinated by the passion from the young speakers, youth, thought-provoking data and statistics pre and post COVID. So as I have been an activist, you know, we have to uh, request you to celebrate life post COVID and celebrate the way we have been trying to make a difference after COVID. So coming back to our topic. So let me, before I start my PowerPoint, it may not have either power or points, but some stories to tell, some of the experiences that we have been gathering over the years from the communities and talking about the education gap particularly in the urban settings. So this is how this morning we have heard this interesting 
theories and how to put theories into practice, particularly on you know, community-based targeting. How do we target our programs as non-state actors, all this, and how to, what we have been also keeping in mind, that how to convince the governments, how to work with the government. Otherwise, we may not, as non-state actors, we may not work for the government, but how to work with the government. That is important, and how to convince the government. It could be hard evidence, it could be some stories from the field, it could be uh, like public hearings, that's all the things that we have been doing in Bangladesh, and government has been trying to do its bit, but we are also trying to do our bit. So there are definitely gaps in education. Uh, as we discussed yesterday, et cetera, and uh, as we discussed, learned this morning how to target so let me start with this story before I go to my PowerPoint, because it will be too quick. The PowerPoints, I don't want to discuss anything and everything. It will be available uh, by the organizers for all of you. But it's pre-COVID 2018. So as our organization has been campaigning for establishing right to education, so a little girl, six-year-old girl, and her parents came to uh, our office because they know that we campaigned for right to education. And my colleagues brought this girl and her parents to my room. And then what happened actually in Bangladesh, because all these so-called good performing schools, high schools particularly, uh, primary, secondary, and higher levels up to grade 12, from grade one to so, because there is such a competition for maybe 500 seats, 5,000 apply. So government issued a circular that now from here it will have to be a lottery. Lottery will be done in front of the education officials by the concerned school and those to ensure equity in a way. Otherwise it was impossible. People were paying money and getting into those good performing schools. But how about the urban poor? So what happened, this lottery, this girl, you know, won this lottery, six year old, first grade entry. And then she came, well, something happened with her parents. Then I asked her, what happened? Her father was a street uh, food vendor and mother was a housemaid. But she was interested to go into that so-called good performing public, not public school, but private school, heavily subsidized by the government. Government has a, some kind of regulatory authority on them. But what happened? This girl told me, I passed, but my parents failed in the exam. I said, what happened? No exam? No, after the lottery, they were called, this whole family was called inside the head teacher's room and they interviewed the parents and they realized that these parents are not going to pay the money because they are not in a position to pay the money. They belong to the urban poor households. So they told them that it's not possible for this girl to get admitted because you can't pay in future. So this, these kind of media reports were coming. Media works very closely with us were coming that they were charging excessive education fees. And then this girl and her family came to us. Nobody was doing anything, but government put a ceiling on how much they could charge. At least that's what the government did. So it was kind of a partnership with the government with us. But then, then what I did when this girl told me, my parents failed, so I picked up my phone and called a human rights lawyer. And I, we decided as an organization to go to the highest court of law challenging these schools. And after one year, we won the case, went for public interest litigation, established the right to education, and 47 schools in the city of Dhaka forced to return excessive money to their parents. That's what happened when you work with the communities, when we work 
for establishing their rights. But during COVID, the parents lost their income because the food vendor was not allowed to sell food. So what they did, they did. I was, my colleagues were tracking that girl and then they took her to an alternative education school that's called non-formal education school. So we have all those stories to tell, but what all these stories are telling us. So that's what uh, I would like to, I don't want to go to the context uh, because everyone knows you will be getting it. So what happened, the realities and the challenges, um, we have been doing quite successful Bangladesh because the government has a targeted program of uh, intervention for providing stipends to girl children. Now there are more girls in schools, so we have campaigned with the government to focus on targeting even the underprivileged boys. So now this stipend every month goes through mother's cell phone account and 20% boys are also now getting targeted intervention, the stipend. So there are lots of government interventions, but whether these are actually being monitored, that's where we come in, the challenges. So strategies, what we heard yesterday, it's a multi-pronged strategy we have to, but first we have to understand and we have to realize all of us here, we know it's politics. It may not be party politics, but education is part of politics. And when we deal with this kind of politics, we need to tell our governments, our international community. There is a lot of discussion about transforming education summit last month in New York and the vision, 20, uh, vision of our even secretary general. But what happened? You should have seen, I was there. When the declaration was being accepted, the whole General Assembly room was empty. Not many heads of governments, not many education ministers or decision makers were there. So these are the things. You made a commitment. I am, I am actually challenging the governments. If you make a commitment at the international forum, Please don't turn these into talk shops. Please fulfill your commitments. And that's where non-state actors can do. Can, they can hold their governments. We are in Bangladesh. We are following up with test commitments with our government. They will be having a big consultation soon. And we will be working with the communities for asking them. So before coming here, so good practice, talking to communities. We have instituted education watch in 1999. Since then we have produced 18 research studies. You have heard about Prathom's ACR model. We have been working before even Pratham started, but talking to communities, getting hard evidence, and then placing it to the government. One example is the national education policy that was adopted by our parliament in, the, in 2010. When it was being formulated, we challenged the formulation committee that we would like to go for local level consultation because you can prepare a wonderful policy, but the communities have to know what uh, is there in the policies. We organized 36 consultations at the local level, and the formulation committee, a high level, all academics and celebrities are there. They went with us to listen to the community because they said, oh, we don't have time to consult people like this. You go ahead, we'll accept your recommendations. 70% of local level recommendations were accepted by the government. And now it's part of the national education policy. But education policy is one thing. Rest is implementation and monitoring. Who is going to do that? Government, definitely. It's a state responsibility. So the way forward, as I have mentioned in my 
we, as non-state actors, can't just you know, do it. We have our limitations. If any of you, any organization, any agency, international, national, or local, ask Campaign for Popular Education, the organization which I'm heading, that we would like to organize a local level consultation in that particular remote rural area in Bangladesh. I can organize it within 48 hours because we have 800 plus community partners in different locations from a remote rural area. But what we have been forgetting even in this conference is climate induced challenges. I'll be finishing this one, my presentation with that particular one that we have been, it's uh, UNHCR actually, and then the UN Climate Fund discovered that because we have been having six warning signals in within three months, the best fishing season for our fishermen community in the coastal areas of Bangladesh, their livelihood is at stake. Because when you have number three warning signal, you can't go for fishing. And what are they doing? They're opting for getting children out of school. Because that's, that's a big burden on them. And when they're making a choice, which one of their child will be going to school, it goes for the boys, normally, in rural households. In the urban areas, slums, we have. We've been able to reduce poverty before COVID from 40% to 18%. But during COVID, now, Ukraine war, our government is facing the heat of it and climate-induced challenges our communities facing and the hardship that they are going. So we have to go for I suppose my request would be to, it has to be, there is no single game changer in education. So we have to go for multi-pronged strategies. Convincing the government at one hand, convincing the international community not to deprioritize education. Maybe COVID related challenges, maybe Ukraine war related challenges, maybe climate induced challenges. But please, please don't deprioritize education in your planning, designing, and programming. And take non-state actors with you, the governments and international community who could bring in the voices of the local communities. Thank you so much. I would be happy to respond to questions and clarifications if needed. Thank you. Can I give you just one example of this one? This is a little simple booklet, a pocket book of SDG 4, because our young people wanted it, bilingual. But who are the ones who supported it? Government of Bangladesh, UNESCO, GPE, and our organization. So it's the collaboration and partnership that we have been talking about since yesterday. Thank you. Thank you for those utterly inspiring words, Rashida. I believe that we all felt that uh, the power of the grassroots activism um, as it fills the policymakers' heads and hearts, I believe, uh, with the work that you're doing in Bangladesh. Uh, moving on, we're going to go to our second speaker. Um, coming from shoes of a teacher into a shoe of a policymaker, um, and um, working across Latin America and the Caribbean as the advisor for UNICEF, regional advisor, education advisor for UNICEF. Um, it is my pleasure to host Italo Dutra um, at the stage and uh, looking forward to hear your, your kind messages. Thank you.
Yes. I should be sleeping at this moment. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for the organization to invite me, especially UNICEF IPRO, the East, uh, Southeast Asia and Pacific uh, Regional Office for UNICEF, UNESCO, SIMEO, uh, Save Your Children, and the government of Thailand. I echo Mercedes' uh, pleasure to be in Bangkok. It's my second time here. And I think I, I, I'm going to leave this city even more in love with Southeast Asia and with, with Asia uh, than I was before. I, I, I happen to serve as a regional education advisor for a few, uh, only a few months, uh, right before the pandemic uh, here in Bangkok. So it's, and I really know that this is an amazing uh, region to be. Uh, let's let's move. Oh, here it is. Well, I'm going to talk about, uh, I, I, I made up a bit of a, a hack on this, on this session because I'm going to talk about, of course, poor uh, communities, but uh, of course I'm, I'm blending a bit of uh, access to education and uh, uh, fighting learning poverty with two examples from Brazil, uh, my home country, and the second example is from my home uh, state in Brazil. So I'm going to start with you, uh, talking to you regarding the, the numbers of Brazil. Brazil is, uh, of course, you all know it's a big country. And uh, regarding the education system, Brazil has tr uh, 26, 26 states and one federal district and 5,768 municipalities. It's, it's, it's a huge country. We have 178,400 uh, schools. And they, of course, they offer from early childhood education to upper secondary education. You, ha you see there in the graphic that almost 83% uh, percent are, uh, of the education offer in Brazil. It's offered by public schools, mostly by state and municipal schools, almost half of it by municipal schools. Brazil has a very uh, decentralized education system. Every uh, municipality is autonomous in its, uh, in its education systems. They have their own uh, education board. They have their own, uh, they are, of course, um, uh, follow the national policies and the state's policies in terms of curriculum, in terms, in terms of uh, the organization of the system, but they have pedagogical and they have administrative uh, autonomy to do so, and they have state's funds to fund every school uh, and every, uh, which, which uh, uh, covers money coming from municipalities, from the states, and from the federal government. 2.2 2, 2 million teachers in, uh, and 162,796 principals. This is data from the last year's uh, school census, okay? And of course, almost 47 million students. Oh, I lost it here, but well, I can follow there. My first example is regarding a big state in, a north, uh, in the northern region of, of the country, the Amazonas state. It's the biggest in terms of territory state in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, it is, of course, the area of the Amazon forest. And it's, uh, it's pr uh, probably uh, the, the area that has a, a concentrated po population in Manaus, the, the, the biggest city. Almost half of the state population is there, two, two million. And the other half, it's like spread all over this big territory. Most of it reachable only by river, okay? So there's a lot of small communities in this state. And what the example that I'm going to talk about is how can we reach, especially in the, uh, the, uh, the I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about here, is students that usually went to primary school, some of them lower secondary school, and they drop out because there was no school available for them. So the state invested in a media center located in Manaus, that were uh, they were it, it, they were uh, uh, like verifying that it would be impossible to build schools or secondary uh, 
upper secondary schools in every community, but they will be able to having school facilities with uh, uh, satellite uh, connection, two-way connection, and then they have produced this media center they, uh, in which they, they broadcast uh, classes to every one of, it, it is most, uh, almost uh, to, uh, 2005, uh, 2,700 communities uh, in, diff in 900 schools, reaching om almost 50,000 students. These students, uh, they, they participate in these classrooms. It, it's, it's a hybrid classroom. They receive classes from Manaus, from the capital, but they, they, uh, all the, all the, the, uh, the classes are facilitated in presence by tutors. So here you can see some pictures on, in which we, you have uh, the best technology that, that, that they can in terms of producing the classes. Uh, it's, it's live classes, so teachers are in Manaus and they are broadcasting it for almost 1,200 uh, different classrooms with tutors and, and kids and, and children present there for, for, for receiving the classes. Uh, they have the, 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 the production studio in Manaus and with this they can have classes and interact with the teachers using uh, satellite TV and uh, a like IPTV communication uh, uh, broadcast. So it, it, it can be two way that the students can talk with the teachers and they can receive, uh, of course, information from the teachers real time online. It, it allowed to access, uh, access to education for more than 50,000 students that otherwise without this system wouldn't be able to finalize their secondary education. So it's a very interesting example. It has been running since 2007 with, because it, they started with a teacher training program and they said, well, if we can train teachers uh, in this uh, hybrid online mode uh, 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 with TV uh, supporting it, we could also maybe help to have more, more students in, this, in the Amazon forest to uh, be able to access education in their communities and be being able to, to complete their secondary education. So this is a very interesting example that we, uh, that we, uh, we, we cannot forget that we are in the middle of the crisis and reach out, reaching out the, the ones that are not be, being able to uh, access education, it's a very important thing. My second example would be regarding my home state, uh, the state of Ceará, uh, in Brazil, but but especially it is it all started with uh, uh, this this like almost V uh, shaped uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, V shaped uh, a city called Sobral. Sobral was one of the is one of the poorest uh, cities in Sierra State. It was in the in the very beginning of this of this uh, uh, this measurements and this change. In, pol in education policies in this specific city, uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, top school uh, performing, so it was like it wasn't that bad, but wasn't that good uh, in terms of performing in t uh, in uh, 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 students' assessment in these uh, in these schools. So this uh, this city they started with a program that eventually became the whole state policy for education, which means they decided that every child should learn to write and read at the right age, which, which means in Brazil, uh, at the, by the end of the second, uh, the second grade in the education system, in the primary uh, education system. So they decided that every child has the right to write, to read and write, uh, and they all should have uh, these uh, rights fulfilled during this period. And so they targeted, uh, with, of course, talking about the uh, upper, uh, the lower secondary uh, uh, education, they all should be fulfilled and they have all, uh, they have to have the right level of education on the ninth grade, but they started with the 
fifth grade. So everyone should be writing and, re and reading, and it, it will be measured. We have national evaluations, and I'm going to show a, a bit of, of the results uh, of what they did. What they did was especially to have a student-centered uh, uh, methodology in every school with uh, a very uh, focused curriculum. It's, a, it's imp important to say that. We have been working on curriculum reforms in all of regions, in all, especially, I think, uh, both in, in, in East, uh, East, East, Southeast Asia and Pacific, on, on curriculum reforms, uh, uh, after curriculum reforms. But, uh, but then, what they decided is, let's focus. Let's, let's talk le uh, regarding foundational uh, literacy and literacy. Foundational learning. That will be important for everyone if they, are, they have a good pace, they can uh, step up and, be, uh, and achieve uh, better results in their academic life, okay? So they target all students to be li literate by the end of second, uh, of second grade. Of course, they centered on, on, on students. Of course, they discussed on the, the main actors uh, of, of all of that, which means the teachers, that they have to be engaged, they have to be well prepared, they have to have the, the best information and the best uh, uh, materials to achieve these results. And of course, we have accountability in every school. So the principles that used to be indicated by politics, they have been replaced by trained uh, school principals. This is one, one big change, of course, that, that was very important in terms of accountability for every school to uh, reach uh, good results. They have prepared focus materials. They have prepared and trained teachers. And we are talking about, it, it started in the, in the city of Sobrao in 2005, and then in the CRI state, in the whole 184 municipalities, uh, it started by the end of 20, 2007. So during this period, they have the, pol uh, the same political group taking over the state uh, politics. It's not, not, only, not, not necessarily the same party, but the same political group. They were taking over uh, politics uh, during a sustained period of, period of time. So this is a very important con important condition condition for this uh, for these results. This is a graph. This is a uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, report produced by World Bank, from which I took uh, some of these graphs and data. Uh, it is it is listed in the end of the presentation. I, I understand that it will be shared with you all, but you can see from 2005 to 2017, the 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 the. Where we were in, in Sobrao and where we were in CRI State, uh, oh, well, no, where we were in Sobrao, uh, I'm going to talk about CRI State in, in a while, in terms of primary education, lower secondary education, and in comparison, you have the green lines uh, uh, in terms of uh, in, in Brazil, the uh, red lines on private schools in the richest uh, city uh, of Brazil, Sao Paulo. And then you have the results of Sobral. What they did was remarkable in terms of producing real results in terms of uh, uh, children uh, and adolescents learning their, uh, what they have to learn in, in terms of uh, uh, what we can measure in Brazilian system. It, it is measured in a scale from 1 to 10 uh, in the Brazilian uh, assessment school. It, it combines the grades of the students in, in math and language with the amount of students that remain at school. So school dropout and uh, uh, school failing interferes in these grades. So it's an important to like just combine an uh, index that will, uh, the, especially the school dropout and uh, school failing, it acts as a moderator of, this, of the students' rating, uh, gradings. So it's very important. For, this is a, it's a, it was established in 2005, and so we have measures from, from there in this report up to 2017. So in the end, I just wanted to show you that what happened in this small city has impacted the whole state. 
the, the state secretary of education, they have a, a, a combined uh, accountability in terms of results for the municipalities and for their own uh, education system, because we have separated municipal systems and state systems. But the CRI state, they took accountability of both their municipalities and their own system. One important thing that happens, it, these are results from 2021. Uh, uh, 87 out of 100 top performing schools were from the CRI state on fifth grade. This is last year. Seven, 70 out of 100 uh, top performing schools were also from CRI state, and they are slowly reaching out to uh, the upper secondary uh, education, the 12th grade, in which the, the students finish their their, uh, their education. So this is a very interesting example. Of course, we are opening the discussion here uh, regarding uh, how can we really fight learning poverty. There's a lot of, of course, uh, detail you can you can find out uh, in the reports that I provided in the end of, in terms of the references. But I just want us not to forget that we are in crisis. We should be acting in emergency mode. We should be reaching out to every child. We, sh we should be assessing what they've learned and, and what they've lost in terms of uh, learning during the pandemic. We should be uh, prioritizing curriculum in terms of looking at uh, what are the essentials and the foundational for us to achieve better results. We have to increase catch-up programs, we have to in increase uh, and, and find out every child, especially the most disadvantaged ones, for, and giving them every, every possibility in terms of learning opportunity for them to catch up and to be a top performer at, as everyone else. And of course, we, don't, we, we cannot forget, and, and the pandemic has showed us, regarding uh, social well-being and mental health in this process. This is the rapid framework. It's, uh, it's uh, a framework that was developed during a, after a, uh, a pulse survey in more than 150 countries. And it, is, it has been devel developed by UNICEF, World Bank, and UNESCO. It was launched this year, 2022. And it is important for us uh, also to understand that we have a lot of uh, work to do. And both Latin America and the Caribbean and the uh, Southeast Asia and Pacific has a lot of uh, a lot of in common to discuss in terms of having middle and high income countries with a lot of inequalities and we have a lot of to interact and to discuss and learn about each other and learn from each other and many 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 examples. Thank you very much. You, you, in the presentation we have all the, the references that I, I use for this presentation. The link for every document is there. Thank you very much. very much a lot of very very inspiring stories both from um, Sierra and Sobral um, and seeing the metrics in the end definitely makes us wonder okay how do we get there um, it would be good to see that competition among many states I believe and um, this is exactly what we will try to do I guess um, as our next speaker um, who will be joining us joining us over zoom I'm not very techy guys so I'm not sure how this will work but the um, Director of the Vietnam Institute of Educational Sciences, Dr. Leanne Vin, uh, will be joining us as the final speaker for this series, and then we will dive into discussion, hopefully with some good conclusions to carry from here. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so thank you. I mean, thanks uh, organizer for inviting me to join this, I mean, a very important event. And uh, I'm so sorry that I cannot uh, make uh, in person, I mean, to attend, I mean, the conference in person. And so I have to join, I mean, remotely. But thanks to, I mean, the technology that I, I still can make a presentation. And uh, I will follow up with the other two presentations to talk about equitable education in uh, Vietnam and with a focus on the urban poor. I mean, the topic of this uh, session. So let me share my... Uh, my slide. Okay, here we go. 
So similar with uh, Mr. Italo from Brazil, I would like to, I mean, talk about a little bit bigger pictures, not only focus on the open pool at the beginning. I wanted to tell you, I mean, give you a brief information about the Vietnam's education with the focus, with the touch on the access and the equities and see at the qualities uh, despair between the different groups of the Vietnamese student. And then we will focus on, I mean, the open pools and see what are their challenges what we can do, what the recommendation that we can, can, can make for them. And uh, I have been inspired a lot, I mean, by the presentation by Ms. Saradas uh, from, uh, from Bangladesh, when she talked about, I mean, if we want to make a change, right? I mean, we really need to show the commitments, I mean, even from the top-down level. And uh, in, in Vietnam, I mean, one of the uh, reasons, I mean, how we can achieve the education, I mean, the high performance and good performance in general in, in education in Vietnam is a commitment by the governments. And it has been so in the past 10 years on the strong commitment of the government to improve the quality, the accessibilities of education in general. So over the past 10 years, if you can see, I mean, from the finger on the right, the number of the ECE children has increased sharply and is mainly at the public sectors and it has been so by one of the achievements uh, that we have achieved in uh, 2017 when we achieved the universal um, education for the five years old children. And at the primary and the lower secondary levels, the number of the students has increased slightly. And at the upper secondary level, the number of the students has increased slightly over the past 10 years. And uh, if you're looking at the diagram on the right, at the bottom of the right, you can see that the net enrollment rate in the primary and the lower secondary levels was very high. It's up to 99 and 92%, but the rate at the upper secondary level was only 72%. And uh, in, the next, in the next few slides, I will show you more, I mean, geographics and uh, some disparity between this number. And we can see, I mean, where will be the main issue for that low number at the upper secondary levels. So overall, there's a relative high survival rate across the learning levels. And you can see the pseudo cohort survival profile by the region that has been taken, I mean, for the last 10 years. And remember that it does not include the, uh, the vocational training uh, streams because in Vietnam, we have two ministries, the Ministry of Education and Training, we uh, administer the official education and the Molisa, the Ministry of, uh, of Labor's Invalids and Social Affairs, they will take care for the technical and vocational educations. So you can see, I mean, the survivors, the survival rate is quite high uh, at all of the levels. However, there's some, some problem. If you're looking from the grade nine to grade 10, the transition rate are quite low and it should be the point that we need to, I mean, uh, uh, improve in the next decade. And the percentage of the repeaters per grade and regions, you can see it's quite low, it's very low uh, for the primary, but it's also a, a problem when we go up to the upper secondary and uh, high school. And um, mostly, I mean, it's a problem with the Central Highlands and the Mekong River Delta. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And if you, oh, sorry. Okay. And if you're looking at the profile of the children who do not complete the school, you can see there are some uh, issues here. For example, I mean, looking at the lower corners, we can see from the urban and the rural. The urban uh, occupy about 25% of the children who do not complete school. And most of them are from the poor uh, families. There's some few reasons for that. You know, for the urban poor in the big cities, most of them are immigrant uh, children. They come when their family, their parents move from the rural to the urban for their, for their work. And also from, I mean, uh, other families. And the challenging for them is they don't receive, I mean, the same support as the student in the urban areas. And the second point is even when they receive the support, the families, because of their poor condition, they may not use that for the education uh, 
education purpose. And we need to, I mean, look at that in a deeper result. Yes, uh, on this slide, I think I will skip it because of the time limit, but you can see there's a gap between the, 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 the student from the different uh, background. If you're looking at the top corner again, you can see the difference of the PISA point for the urban and rural is around 30 points. And the difference for the top and the bottom economic status uh, backgrounds will be about 60 points. And remember that 30 points is around one year of studying. So there's a big, big gap between the student from the urban and the rural, and also a big gap between the urban poor and the urban, I mean, student. It will be around two years of the schooling, and how can we close that gap? And I totally agree with, I mean, the presentation by Mr. Italos when he mentioned about, I mean, the COVID-19. We have seen a big issues, I mean, for the urban poor families in Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi during the COVID-19, when the family cannot accommodate for their kids, they have to send the kids home, a lot of trouble for them. I mean, they even don't have the basics, uh, I mean, basics uh, requirements for their kids to continue the study. Yes, I will skip that slide. So now I would like to talk about, I mean, the recommendation, because I mean, the other presentation had, the presenters also have mentioned about that, but what we can look at and how we can do, I mean, to support and to close the gap for the student in the in the urban, uh, in a hardship, the government should re-evaluate re the policy on the financial assistance for the poor student. And I mentioned before, I mean, they have very difficult to get the social support uh, and it's quite a disadvantage for them when they are not uh, officially registered in the province. The second point is the school leaders from the different urban poor school should have a strong leadership and a good man management skill. It is not about, I mean, uh, the teaching skill, not about the management skill, but how can you advocate that? How can you aware of the difficulty of the school? How can, you, how can you understand, I mean, the difficulty the student will face? It will be very important. And I have to say that in the big city, for example, like Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, in a very poor, I mean, area, the school in general are kind of, I mean, lower quality compared to other school. So the school leader, I mean, have a lot of challenge uh, at, at that. And at the school level, the teacher need to monitor and assess the effectiveness of the strategy use. And I would like to, I mean, uh, rise up three characteristics that the teachers, they need to improve when they are dealing and they're working with the student in that areas. The first is the awareness. They need to understand their student, understand the difficulty they are facing. The second thing is they need to have a strong knowledge base to support for their children, for their student, because their student will, I mean, that will require a lot of support for their, I mean, study, how to keep up with the performance of their peers. The teacher need to have a very, very strong, I mean, knowledge base in order to do that. And the third point is the high expectation the high expectation for the kids. They need to believe on their children. They need to, I mean, have the high expectation to them and aspiring them to aim for the higher uh, result. The fourth point that I want to write up is the why the assistance programs could lessen the financial burdens of the family, of the urban poor. The effectiveness in terms of the helping the recipient during the critical times should be further investigated. As I mentioned, there are many poor families they receive the assistant, but because of the burdens, the financial burden on them, they don't spend that amount of money directly for the education of their child. So one of the suggestions and proposal is in, instead of, I mean, sending or supporting the money to them, I mean, it's better in the voucher form. So the family should spend it directly for the education. The fifth, the fifth point that I want to mention is the urban poor student should be given the several option in completing their secondary level education. Because when they have the training necessary, they have the, I mean, the, the, the skill, it could increase their employability. So either via scholarship, financing, or any kind of the support, we need to provide them a several option in completing their secondary level education. And the last point I want to mention is technology can be very instrumentals in efforts to help the urban poor student. And I would like to echo from the Ms. Ras Seda's uh, point 
when she mentioned about we need a good data, we need to keep checks on that, we need to have a good plan. And it's all based on, I mean, the data and the, the well-planned uh, effort by the governments. So I, I just want to, I mean, bring into the discussion five recommendations, and I hope that we can share more experience uh, on this uh, discussion, uh, this session today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Lian Nguyen. Um, we have now concluded the three presentations. We're going to have a quick change of scenery here at the stage. Uh, we're going to invite our speakers to join us, um, two of them um, at the stage, as soon as our tech guys help us to sort it out. And um, uh, we hope to have some good questions coming from the group um, and some good discussion about the recommendations to take, to take this discussion forward. Thank you. OK, this feels. Are we good? Thank you. Um, this feels, I would say, much, much more comfortable and natural to have these discussions. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and um, we do have some content on the Menti, which I will uh, hold off for now and ask if anybody in the room would start to, uh, would like to start with some of the questions that you might have after seeing the, the three presentations. Okay, um, please feel free at any point to raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to accommodate. Um, Italo, Rashida, um, Leanne, uh, Win, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're gonna have 30, 40 minutes for this discussion depending on how, how in a good mood we are, um, I guess after, after, this, uh, after this session. So Rashida, I would like to start with a question or maybe um, a topic to discuss with you. Um, it's been, I would say, quite interesting progression from grassroots level in the first presentation to the state level uh, and some provincial and state level discussions in between with Italo's presentation. Um, where do we find the best strategies over the past two years since the crisis started? Who was the, in your perspective, after seeing everything in Bangladesh, who was the best responder? Who provided us with most uh, in terms of education for children? And what were those strategies that we, that we can kind of remember and maybe take on and scale up? Thank you so much, and thanks to the audience, particularly online and towards me and in person. Uh, very good question, but it's a, well, very tricky question. So what happened during, the, during COVID, when it struck, we as a nation are naturally, you know, know how to manage natural disasters because uh, of our, you know, very much vulnerability with climate-induced challenges, etc. Our people could manage natural disasters. But what happened when we were struck with COVID in March 2020 first? Then we were a little shocked. So as government started looking for vaccines and then how to deal with the health crisis first, Education didn't come up that way. Uh, we had the longest, one of the longest school closes for 18 months almost. So when we realized that at one point of time, health workers, both state and non-state work, working on it, but as education workers, we need to convince the government, that was the strategy we followed, that we must have evidence from the field that government has been trying to focus on the how to continue learning as education came in as one of the major points of concern. So we started digging deep into what Carlo has said, looking for evidence that government started focusing on you know, continuing learning at home through online, through television channel, through mobile phone, and then community radio. Four areas. So we started digging deep into it. In November, we actually had a cell phone based research from the field. 
uh, perception study rather, kind of qualitative. So what we followed is that, okay, this is happening, but we came out with the finding 76% of all those students uh, who are supposed to be either online or uh, focusing on TV channels were not reached out. So that came out. Even local education officials were telling us that it was not uh, actually reaching out. So that was the strategy. We first got the hard evidence, shared it th with the government, and the government started rethinking. And then we also provided recommendations that look, these recommendations have come from the community level that governments too should start zoning areas uh, we didn't suggest it. The community suggested in our area, COVID is less than 5% COVID infections. Why can't we reopen schools? Because this is a remote area where children are not even reached out. That happened. So government started thinking about it. And later government started phase out red zone, yellow zone, and green zone uh, in terms of COVID infections. So that's what we managed to convince the government, one strategy. The other, when the government announced the national budget, we discovered, goodness, surcharge levied on internet use because government wanted money to come in, it was in trouble. So what we did, we started campaigning. We gathered all the celebrities in Bangladesh, including cricket stars, sports stars, and football stars. And then, by the way, women's football team you know, of Bangladesh won the South Asia Gold Cup recently, very recently. So sports is very favorite. So we gathered all the celebrities and provided a public statement that this searchers should be withdrawn. So it was withdrawn. So campaigning was one of the strategies. The other one, talking online, to consultation with different education stakeholders. We organized during 20 and 21, organized something like 82 online consultations with local education officials and public representatives like MPs and other decision makers. So all these three strategies. And then, well, government committed to do this, how it's happening in the field. So we started monitoring with local community education watch groups, so in different locations. So these three strategies, one is hard evidence, second is campaigning, third is monitoring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashida. It felt somehow that this question was properly addressed, I would say. Um, Italo won't mind me, but we, we have a very interesting question online that I would like to, to ask to you men, if, if possible. So. Um, having in mind um, the role in the in the public sector, I would say there is a question online: um, How can we advance our strategies in urban um, setting for the urban poor through collaboration of government and private sector? And are there any experiences in that end? And um, maybe uh, for for um, our, our colleague um, in in Vietnam, if if you can share if there are any experiences um, that you can that you can share there. Thank you. Okay, so thank, thank you for, for, for the question. Uh, I, I would like to, I mean, uh, sharing some of the experience and especially during the COVID-19. Uh, you know that, I mean, uh, same in, in, in other countries, Vietnam, we have the first guy very early, early of uh, 2020s. And the, we have two phase when we're facing with the COVID. The first, the first half is zero COVID policies when we close down, clock down everything. And then the government try to get, I mean, the vaccines and vaccinate very quickly and then open the school. But when we look at that, we have seen many of the problems. And now we're talking focus on the urban poor. Many students, even in the urban area, they don't have the device, they don't have the access for the, uh, for, for the internet. And then they cannot, I mean, even joining the online classroom and when we open the school, actually the rural area open quicker, faster, because they have the less case. But for the urban areas, 
they have to close down, close down for a very long time. For example, Hanoi is the last city to open schools again. So what we can do, I mean, the government initiates a program calling the internet and device for youth. And that initiate has been done by the government levels and all of the ministries coming joinings, many of the edtech company, they joinings and they denote, uh, they, they, they uh, donate and uh, I mean, giving the device, the internet uh, support for the kids. And I have to say that it is very successful program that can provide, I mean, many good chance for the student. Yeah, I just want to say one, one thing. I'm actually never sure if this works, so if you can't hear, sorry. Um, oh, can you, you cannot hear that? No, 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 no. Sorry, all, all good. We, we heard it. We heard it all well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was there was um, another question online that that I um, passed to to Italo to give him kind of a heads up. Um, in the meantime, and it. It really is an interesting one, I would say. It, uh, one of the participants online has asked, how do we motivate parents? Um, and I would just circle that also with urban, within urban area where may, maybe access to jobs is higher and they, they spend more time in, in their jobs to work on uh, you know, educating their children because these last two years have, have required, I would say, increased level of participation of parents in the educational process, which was much more direct, much more, um, I would say, in line with what would we traditionally see in school. So, Italo, um, I've given you actually a heads up because I know it's a, it's a tough question, uh, but any thoughts, any thoughts on this one? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's a very interesting. Uh, we are in an era in which uh, we made a huge effort during the pandemic to remote uh, in the direction of remote education or hybrid education on using technology to educate or to help uh, at least to help uh, uh, children and adolescents to stay connected to the school system i would say more we were more uh, maybe more successful on that than on learning the, the evidence that we have have been receiving has pointed out that we have a long, long, long uh, work uh, and a long walk to, to, to walk in terms of, uh, of recovering from that period in terms of learning losses. But also, and uh, I remember, for example, one, one uh, I was still in Brazil. I, I, I arrived at, uh, at the regional office last October. I was still in Brazil. And we uh, discovered that the level of participation of parents during the pandemic has increased. My fear is that we don't learn from it. We don't gather enough evidence on, on, on what have uh, really worked and what, what has not. And we, I don't know, we simply forget uh, that we have to be successful in terms of, of uh, learning outcomes to involve families and communities in children's and adolescents' learning. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of evidence on that. We were just uh, uh, listening to our colleague from MIT regarding the social protection systems. So it is, it is very important. Uh, it, 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 it applies on social, uh, social protection systems in a whole, but of course it also applies in education. We have enough evidence on that. So from my perspective, and I just, I just remember another data that we, we, uh, in, a, in a report where th that we are about to uh, launch globally, Almost 30% of the online platforms that were like put in place for uh, remote learning during the, the pandemic, they are not uh, working at this moment anymore. So we invested a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, resources from our uh, uh, governments to make this happen and we are not learning from it enough. So in the case of parents, I would, I would say that we should uh, gather more evidence on what have worked. Because we, we observed that uh, their participation has increased. They would never like, uh, replace uh, teachers in, this, in these tasks. But of course, they're part of their education. So we have to uh, be more uh, flexible in terms of what kind of involvement parents should, should have. 
in uh, uh, in their children and adolescents learning uh, and in the school uh, or in, at least in the education systems from my perspective we should learn what happened we should learn what uh, parents thought about uh, this period and we should of course implement new methodologies on their involvement and not only invite them to meetings uh, to to report uh, learning outcomes this is uh, this is th this won't help blaming them or blaming their children for not learning hasn't helped anyone we know that we have we've been trying to do so for a long time but there's enough evidence to say that it's not enough so we have to learn from them and from from our experiences during this past year two years because we ha we have invested a lot on that on what have uh, uh, worked and what not and, so, and of course move forward in terms of uh, thinking about what kind of met new methodologies should we, sh we should be testing uh, implementing taking up to scale on on community involvement uh, on, on parents involvement in schools for for early childhood education there is no debate anymore early childhood education without parents it won't have it won't uh, it won't achieve the 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 results that we have seen if they are not involved so I, I would suppose that it will happen, of course, on, uh, uh, for older children and adolescents. So we have to learn from it and we have to uh, understand how can we uh, produce better methodologies and take it to scale. That would be my thoughts. Thank you very much, Italo. Can uh, I add something to that? By all means, yeah, please. Okay. One thing, uh, like we have to learn from the, our experiences. But pre-COVID, we had data, including government data, that in a country like ours, almost 25% of the parents are non-literate. So they are the first generation learners. So we should not be even expecting parents to you know, take them to the learning pathway, etc., cetera, et cetera. But we don't have evidence. Just for example, when this internet, online, etc., came in, the parents welcome it. But the, how to monitor the misuse? Because the parents they don't know how to guide their children, particularly in the urban areas. Both parents are working, so whether they are misusing this internet, or using the smartphone or tab, even provided by different non-state actors and private sector. So this is one point, like early childhood education or ECT, lifelong literacy is also gone. This whole agenda of SDG4, nobody is bothering about it. So this is another way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashida. Um, I'm going to turn back to room. We have a question, I think, um, here. Thank you very much. If you can just introduce yourself mm. for the question. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I hope you can hear me through my mask reasonably well. Is this working? Maybe, yes. I'm yes. not sure. Maybe not the rest of the room. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. My name is uh, Stuart Cameron. I'm from GPE and I'm very sorry I snuck in late to this presentation, missed the beginning. Um, but I, I had a question for um, um, Italo on, on the, the program in Brazil. Uh, you said that the um, program was um, uh, focused on student-centered learning, I think. Um, and in some ways, that was actually a bit surprising to me that it would have large gains in this context. Because uh, although we know that student-centered learning can have large gains, it also has programs to try and do that have failed in a lot of contexts, um, especially if it's delivered through a short-term teacher training in-service uh, program the gains may not be sustained. Uh, and secondly, because knowing everything about the background of these students, um, it doesn't seem to, it seems that something that's purely focused on pedagogy and the teachers wouldn't address all of those other issues which are going on. For example, poverty, which might force them to drop out at some point. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how that worked in this context. Thank you very much. It's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, this is, of course, a, a, a student-centered model, but 
with a lot of, or mainly the main effort on all, all of that was on monitoring everything that, that was happening. Of course, we have uh, a, a little bit of a structured methodology on, on foundational literacy and literacy. That proved to have helped on school dropout and school failing. So this is, this is one in, uh, important thing. But why did, did, did it all happen? Because this, the, the, at the beginning, the municipality has taken the, the, the task to monitor what was going on in every school. To understand all, this is a low performing school. What, happened, what is happening there? What kind of uh, administrative measures I should have to improve uh, teachers' performance, to improve uh, the, the adherence on, on, on the methodology that is being proposed. They're monitoring. Uh, we were discussing regarding assessment formative assessment is part of this uh, of this discussion they have they have not only the the parameterized uh, access uh, to all of that but they decided that well these children in terms of, of learning they have been a, they have to be able by the second grade to be able to read and understand simple texts this is the the goal so what kind of actions should be take like uh, backwards in, 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 uh, to, to make it, this, it, it all happen. So it, it is a student-centered uh, student methodology, but it's also a teacher monitoring methodology. It's also an assessment methodology, and it's also a very well-targeted policy starting at municipal level and then moving up to the state level. And not only state level. We're, in Brazil, we, we tried a national level program. What failed in that in that program? Monitoring. We monitored really, really bad. I was in the Ministry of Education at that time, and we, it was really clear that the monitoring part was not working on. When uh, if you if you enter the State Secretary of the Education Situation Room uh, in, in in Fortaleza, the, the the capital of Ceará State, you could see a lot of screens like we like this one in which he can access the, uh, every student outcome with this formative assessment that they do every trimester uh, in every school, municipal school and state school in the country, in the, in the state. So, of course, there's a lot of monitoring. So, and then we, they create like kind of milestones. Okay, I, I can see that, that this school is having a problem because there's a lot of uh, underachievement uh, uh, students or the teachers are not doing this or that. So they can correct this. But it takes time to do so. And it, it, it takes time to convince teachers and to engage them in this kind of, uh, of processes. But uh, as, as usually in, in our education uh, system changes, it takes some time. It, it, these changes has produced results quickly in a period of quickly talking about education in four or five years, but it, it's sustained uh, uh, improvement de depends on close monitoring, close reinforcement at, uh, at school level, at local level in this case. Of course, there's a lot of uh, other, uh, I don't know, variables that we are not taking in place into that. Uh, the the funding that the state prov that, that the state provides and uh, the way it is used to lever uh, this uh, kind of methodology at municipal level this kind of technical support from state level it's also another very important thing that we have to, to take uh, uh, in account to achieve these results so there's a lot of uh, details that we have to, uh, to have to, to understand and to monitor, to maybe try to address your question. But um, it is a student-centered model, but not only this. It works, a, uh, it has a lot of monitoring, assessment, uh, re, uh, like reconnect the methodology to, uh, uh, I don't know, to, to readapt it, to serve better both teachers and students to achieve results. Thank you very much, Talo. Um, 
I would avoid follow up uh, now because uh, we do have one interesting question also coming up, and I'm not sure if um, if we have Leanne Win still with us. Yeah. Yes. No. Oh, you are. Sorry, we lost you on screen. So um, yes. glad glad to have you to have you here. Now you mentioned it, I think, in your presentation, and this is why I wanted to refer it to you. Um, the question of youth who are actually moving to the urban area and the peri-urban slums, um, that to which extent they have kind of specific challenges and specific factors that we would need to address as they move into the urban or peri-urban area. Um, you know, what would be, I would say, the key elements that we need to bridge or what would be the key barriers to remove for these children and youth as they move to the area, and were there any good strategies, I would say, and this may be for all three speakers, um, you know, I would say preparing them to come to peri-urban or urban area and ensuring that there is no loss of education in this, in this process. Yeah, so the question is for me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so say thank you. So there's a lot of challenge for the kids in that context, the so first of all is, I mean, we all know, I mean, for the uh, financial burdens of the families, they will have, I mean, the hardship, the low access. But I would like to look from the education point of view. When we're talking about the uh, perception, talking about their ambitions in the education, how can we encourage them? We know that, I mean, there's a strong correlation between the parents' education, the parents' backgrounds to the student achievement in the futures, and how we can inspire them that they can do, I mean, much better, right? So one of the recommendations that I mentioned, I mean, in the, my last slides, is we need to provide them the different option so they can complete the secondary education, at least to encourage them to stay in the education as long as they can. So they will have more chance, they have the skill that they need, that they can come back to contribute for the families. The research, so that, I mean, the student mobility is very difficult, especially for the low uh, quantized student. So it will be a very important thing to say. The second point is, I, I want to mention, is about the teachers. The teacher is very important. When they work with the group of the student, they need to know them, they need to be aware of their difficulties, they need to inspire them, how to, I mean, encourage them to continue to working. And the third point is, of course, I mean, strong investment, strong commitment to support for that. We understand that, I mean, most, most of the students in the urban poor setting, they have, they even have the more difficult compared to their peers in the rural area. They are not, for example, in Vietnam, says in, in, in some of the most uh, difficult area, in some of the industrial zones, when the parents work there, the kids move with their families, they don't officially register. Very difficult for them to register for the good school. They have to go, I mean, for the low quality school. The teacher there is not, I mean, up to the pair to the, the, the other school. A lot of challenging for them. And we need to commit, have a more support, stronger support, and have a better, uh, I mean, the, the policy, the policy to, I mean, directly support to that group of the student. Yeah, I just want to raise, I mean, a few more points. Thank you very much, Leanne Wind. Um, Vitalo. May I come in? <laughs> Just yes, please do. Oh, thanks. Uh, and maybe going back to your question regarding the, the, the results that were achieved. I understand that we are, we are talking about, of course, urban areas, and we are talking about the kind of support that both families and, and students have in terms of, uh, of their uh, to achieve learning outcomes, uh, addressing everything that is needed uh, uh, to do so. I think one important question also that we have to ask is what kind of evidence do we have in terms of what changes in school administration, for example, and what changes on uh, teachers' uh, performance should be done in this area, we, in Brazil, in these in these uh, in these schools in, in Ceará as well as in uh, uh, in many other states, we don't have any teacher uh, uh, assessment in terms of testing their knowledge or something like that. But in this specific uh, uh, in this specific 
uh, uh, context that I've, I've mentioned regarding Ceará, one important thing was uh, uh, bigger schools, they perform better than small ones. So they decided to, of course, to analyze uh, in terms of uh, putting uh, student, uh, students together in bigger schools, then uh, leaving them in small schools. Of course, it works in the most of the cases, but as I've mentioned, for example, in, this, in the state of Amazonas, we have, to find, we have also to provide education for the ones that are in remote areas. So we have to, f to combine the strategies on, on, on doing that. So, so this, is, this is one thing. The other thing is, okay, if I'm not uh, able to assess teachers' performance by their own in terms of looking at, uh, asking teachers questions and regarding their performance and all of that, I can assess teachers' performance, performance on their ability to improve learning outcomes of their students. For me, this is the best way to assess teachers. So we have to then understand, okay, uh, in these schools in which we don't have uh, students performing well, what kind of support teachers need to overperform their own performances. So we have also to understand these kind of mechanisms and try to, to improve uh, the monitoring part and of course and, and do the, 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 the right corrections in the, in, the, in the trajectory for them to outperform their own uh, uh, best performances uh, assessment by looking at these kind of, 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 of the things. Of course, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fit in terms of, uh, we have, for example, a lot of systems, uh, education systems that we have in public schools in which the teachers, they do not renovate in terms of they stay uh, working at the same school for a long period and they tend to be uh, lower performance, uh, lower performer uh, teachers uh, uh, during this period. So we have to understand also what kind of incentives in terms of what kind of uh, um, corrective measurements to assess teachers' performance and to provide them the support necessary for their students to thrive uh, in their learning outcomes. So in this, in this specific area, especially in urban uh, 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 peri-urban areas that we are talking about, we have to address the, the, the and give some incentives for, for the best teachers to go there and stay there for a while. I think it's going to be interesting. To that? I'm just going to yeah. expand the question for you, Rashida, yeah, because there is um, an addition that we, that we are seeing on the screen here that also refers back to attitude of both mm -hmm teachers and students. Right. And if you can also maybe speak on this topic uh, based on your uh, very, I would say, grassroots experience, um, you know, how do, we, how do we also work on, uh, Italo mentioned it briefly, you know, can we move their mindset to actually want to work in these areas? I'm not sure, maybe there needs to be some incentives or, or um, other ways of moving them there, but also, how do we make sure that parents, as they move to this peri-urban area, prioritize education of their children rather than maybe livelihood options or, or prospects that might be em emerging in the area? Over yeah. to you, Rashida. Okay, thank you. <coughs> what we did actually pre-COVID 2018, <coughs> we have, excuse me, covered uh, the whole of Bangladesh through a stratified ram random sampling survey and the parents came out with this universal notion of demand for education. So that's accepted, that the parents want education of their kids. But when livelihood is at stake, so they have to make a choice. That's where public financing, I thank our Vietnamese uh, representative here, uh, <laughs> public financing of education is the way here. Otherwise, you know, you have to provide livelihood options. And recently we have done an youth-led action research for, uh, you know, seeing the impact of COVID. And the young people, they came to us saying that we have to provide them options, otherwise they will be going to so many industries around, et cetera, et cetera. So they will not be continuing their studies after even grade 10. 
And very recently, before coming here, I attended in an urban area, not in the mega city, but I visited that area in a uh, not non-state actually school. Uh, it's a mainstream school funded, subsidized by the government. The young people, grade nine and 10, they were asking me this question when I told them I have to rush, I have to catch a flight and attend a meeting and next day to catch a flight to Bangkok. Then I told them that this meeting is happening. They asked me this question. Have you told us, uh, well, you have told us about this education and equity conference. Does equity exist in the world? The family level, the community level, state level? What do you mean by equity? So that reminds me of this particular finding that we had in before SDGs were adopted. In 2015, we published it. It was based on a student assessment, but we followed the methodology of UNICEF. It's called ABC, Assessment of Basic Competencies. And here we discovered that in, in the urban areas, national sample, but most of the third graders only achieving 35% competencies in three you know, subjects, maths, and then um, our own language and English. But we use the same tools in the city of Dhaka, mega city, in the so-called best performing school. The score was 72%. So we thought this quality divide in education, how are we going to deal with it? So that question we brought in during the Incheon you know, meeting, and then Incheon declaration came in, which formed the basis of the SDG four. But the quality divide during COVID, whether it has increased it or not, government actually instituted a national student assessment uh, every two years they have been doing it after our study because that <laughs> brought the government to account. And then the other thing that has happened is that national teacher recruitment and promotion strategy. But you know what, when the government issued that order, who went to the court challenging it? It was the teachers, the teacher unions. They said it will be difficult for them to sit for that test because they are already there for maybe 20 years, 25 years. So, but recently the government won the case and instituted it. So we supported the government in this kind of things. So teacher assessment, student assessment, both have to be done, not only by the non-state actors, but I would like to come back to this whole question of monitoring and monitoring and monitoring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashrida. Um, do we have anything from the audience? Okay, so um, as we as we move along, I want to just we have a few minutes left, and I want to open a, a Pandora's box uh, of a sort. Um, how do we address multiple vulnerabilities in this very fragile context? How can we consider questions of gender, questions of disability, questions of um, I would say non-traditionally um, sexual orientations? How do we address those in this, I would say, already over complex um, area in peri-urban and urban settings? Are there elements that we should kind of keep in mind as we are kind of bringing this, this session to the close? And maybe a question for, for all three speakers. Thank you. Whoever feels comfortable to start. Mm, by the I way. can start. Uh... There's a famous uh, Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, who says that education doesn't change uh, the world, which, which education changes people and then people could change the world. And from my perspective, I, uh, we have been, we have been uh, flooded by a lot of evidence on, especially on uh, school violence uh, in the, uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, uh, we, the education sector, we don't take this uh, serious enough. 
we keep uh, using our uh, uh, education uh, monitoring systems to, just to, to measure um, how many, if, the, if there are water, if there are uh, basic sanitation, or if there are the number of teachers, the number of schools, the number of students. But we have to, have to be more serious on school uh, violence because, of course, School is not is not a, a, a an island of uh, of uh, protection. It reproduces the violence that is already in the communities in the society. So we it's not it's not uh, possible for us to simply say well. Most of the time, of course, school uh, acts as a protective environment for for students and for uh, vulnerable students. But we have a lot of racism, racism xenophobia, uh, homophobia, transphobia in, uh, in schools. We have a lot of gender-based violence in schools. Uh, it, it, it's, it, there's enough evidence uh, coming from different uh, places, globally, uh, regional level, uh, uh, country level, that this is part of the school uh, environment uh, right now. And again, in our school reforms, we are really uh, uh, worried about the now the the, the competency-based curriculum. But then, okay, how can we move from this kind of uh, uh, ethos and uh, environment to think about the real issues that happens at school? So, if you don't have a, a, a good environment for 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 learning, which means if if the school is violent or reproduces the violence that is uh, already present in their communities, we won't achieve any uh, good results. So it has to be part of the discussion from our uh, sector, how to address violence in, in this area. The second, the second uh, part of my, my, my thoughts on that should be, we also have to understand that uh, the children with disabilities, the indigenous populations, the uh, Afro-descendants in many countries, the ethnic minorities, they are not the last mile. They are the ones that should be reached with more effort for us to uh, uh, have a, an equitable education system. We are in an in a international conference on equitable education. So we have to be talking about how to reach this population, because we have good examples of, of, of uh, maybe small-scale uh, uh, initiatives that really works. But okay, well, how can we learn from it and go to, uh, to, to, uh, to scale in, 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 in our countries, in our education systems? This is another part of, of, of the discussion that we have to be touched at some point. Uh, we have to touch at some point and to be very thoughtful on what kind of actions are we producing in our uh, organizations, in our uh, efforts to, to help governments to do things, because we are not doing uh, sufficiently well. We have a lot of great examples, small scale examples. We are not reaching out equitable systems because we are still reproducing violences. We are still reproducing uh, inequalities in our interventions to help children, uh, 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 most disadvantaged children. So from my, pers my perspective, I would go for, of course, we have to start with them. We have to start looking for the most disadvantaged ones. We have to be more thoughtful of all, all of that. And we have to understand that uh, going to that direction will benefit everyone, not only them. So I will tackle violence and I will tackle uh, inequalities. Thank you very much. Um, Rashida, or uh, do you want to carry on yeah. with this one? Anyone wants to carry on on this one? Yeah, I could. Uh, okay. okay. So one thing is yesterday and to this morning also, education should not be thought about in kind of a box. It's multi-sectoral and multi-sectional. We have always been hearing. Where are our finance ministers <laughs> when they're transforming education summit? The declaration, because ultimately it comes to education financing, public financing. This I is one thing. Remember your question from yesterday morning. Yeah. So that was <laughs> one thing. The school violence. Yes. 
this is actually increasing. We have been getting uh, media reports. We have to go for actually scientific data collection, violence, but we also set with school, you know, ninth and 10th graders and the local police commissioner. It was an urban setting. We had this meeting. Uh, the local police con commissioner and the local municipal administrator were there. The police commissioner was suggesting that they should be instituting a counselor, you know, counts for counseling services, but it takes a lot of money, actually, investment <coughs> to just to employ a counselor in some 65,000 schools. It's impossible. So the, the girls were saying that please don't employ any counselor in our school, go for counseling our parents and our teachers. That will do. So listening to young voices, it's important. Those who are the victims or beneficiaries of our systems. This is one about disability, ethnicity. We often forget the linguistic minorities in many of our countries. We have something like 57 ethnic minority groups and 10 of them have their own scripts and languages. We motivated the government, showing them like what you were saying, the models. Some models are there, but government has to replicate and scale it up. So government acknowledged five different ethnic languages already and publishing textbooks for them, particularly at the pre-primary level. But when we are talking to the ethnic minority groups themselves, they were saying, if we follow only our books, then we'll be out of the mainstream. So they had their reason to be a little suspicious, but it's only introduced. That's why at the early childhood, you know, care and education level, pre-primary. But at least this is a good beginning. So looking at all those models, uh, we government could, any government could look at the models of successful models or best practices, and then they could replicate and follow it up with proper investment. Thank you very much, Rashida. Uh, Lanvin, anything you wish to contribute on this one? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to flow and want, want to raise one point. So we know through the COVID pandemic, the the one who hit hardest will be the one most in the most disadvantaged uh, conditions. When you mentioned about the disabled student, when you mentioned about the, the other, I mean, group of the student, we know, I mean, they are facing even more, I mean, higher challenges compared to other students. And we understand that, I mean, the schooling is very, very important for everyone. For education, we're usually talking about the student who stay in the school. We don't talk much about the student who stay outside the school. And most of the statistics is underestimate about the number of the out of school children. Reasons, I mean, statistics have been done, I mean, the effort by the government showing that the number, I mean, the real, the real numbers may be double the official number that we announced about the children's out of the school difficulties. So I want to rise up the education should be more flexible. We should give the student more chance, more option to rejoice, to rejoice, to coming back to the system more flexible. So if we give them more chance to get access for education, it will be a good lesson learned that I learned from them in the, through the two years of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lanwin. And as we close the session, I'm going to actually come back to you um, and to all three of the of our speakers. Um, we are merely a servants for children who are to be educated, and um, we should send them also a message from this place. So, within one or two sentences, um, for children in peri-urban areas, for children in urban slums, anywhere where they might be facing all the difficulties that we have spoken of but also their parents and teachers. Share a sentence or two of what you would tell them once you meet them. Um, but please make it brief because we are kind of running over time since it was a very, very interesting session. Uh, maybe I go first? Yes. Please do. <laughs> okay, so you can do it. So please have a high expectation on yourself. Thank you very much. I'm going to let, let you uh, arrange it. Let me let me jump in and then let Rashida to be the, the wiser one to, 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 to end it. Out. Yeah, to close us out. Uh, first, I think uh, strong going back to the uh, intersectionality. 
uh, stronger social protection, protection systems helps on learning outcomes. The second one, community-based uh, uh, interventions has proven that we have, uh, we are able to, to tackle all these issues that we have mentioned. Uh, society, government, uh, civil society, organized society will also help on that. And the third one would, would be let list, let's use and listen to our children and adolescents. They have a lot to teach us on what we should be doing to help them to learn. Yeah. Mr. Shida, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, taking the cue from it. Hello. One thing, uh, the message that should go from this particular conference to governments that please, please don't deprioritize education in your plans, in your programs, in your budgeting. It has to be a priority sector, just like health and economy. This is one. And number two, all these kids, I had meetings after COVID in the urban slum areas. Uh, as you know, in NGOs in Bangladesh, we organize courtyard meetings called, you know, where the local municipal commissioner was also there. The kids were telling us, please ask the government to help our parents with some kind of subsistence allowance or something that they could help or raise their income so that they could support us. Uh, so this is children's voices coming for their parents. So these are, I believe in community power. So the second thing is to, you know, believe in community power of the community to tell us, to guide us. And third is to governments, they have to make their decision right. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of our participants. Um, Leon Nguyen, um, who is the Viet uh, CEO, Director General of Vietnam Institute of Educational Science. Um, Italo Dutra, Regional Education Advisor of UNICEF for Latin America and the Caribbean. And Rashida Choudhury, uh, Executive Director of Campaign for Popular Education. Uh, please give them a round of applause for this uh, wonderful session that they have given us. Thank you very much for mine. I believe that we will close here uh, and that lunch is actually already started. So for those of you who are hungry, um, I advise taking the, the turn on the left. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.